Where does yesterday's future, which is already here, ready here, ready here, ready here, meet today's future, which is about to happen, and tomorrow's future, which could be just minutes away? Welcome to Technology Revolution, the future of now. Where host Bonnie D. Graham asks savvy futurists for their predictions about the tech-driven trends that are shaping our future right now. Here's your host who will take us into the future of now, Bonnie D. Graham. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We've got a very interesting show for you today. Let me read the buzz to open the show. I have a quote from Lifeboat Foundation Scientific Advisory Board member Michael Anisimov, and that's a long title. Listen up, and this will set the stage for what we're talking about today. I have such a great panel, you won't believe it. Transhumanists, that's our key, advocate the improvement of human capabilities through advanced technology. Not just tech like the gadgets you get from Best Buy, but tech in the grander sense of strategies for eliminating disease, providing cheap but high-quality products to the world's poorest. That's a good goal. Improving quality of life and social interconnectedness and so on. Technology we don't notice because it's blended in with the fabric of the world, but you'd take immediate note of its absence if it became unavailable. Try walking to another country. If you didn't have to flee your country, I'll leave it there. And they look ahead 20, 30 years and beyond. His top 10 transhumanist technologies, that's what we're going to talk about today. Cryonics, virtual reality, you've all heard of VR. Gene therapy, RNA interference, I don't know what that is, but we might find out from one of my panelists. Space colonization, so many movies about that, it almost sounds like the neighborhood next door. Cybernetics, Automatic self-replicating robots. Ooh, move over. Molecular manufacturing. Mega scale engineering. Mind uploading. Some days I would like my mind to upload. And AGI, artificial general intelligence. That's a takeoff on artificial intelligence. I have Professor Agnes Steib at transforms.me with me today. We have Chris Kalabukas at Hello Future. Hello is in lowercase and future is in uppercase. We have transdisciplinary practitioner Jacob Perkins, who was a guest recently on the show, and another returning guest, Linda Roth at LJR Consulting Services. They're going to share their transhuman technologies predictions as far out as, everybody get ready, 2050, 2050, 2050. I don't know how many of you will be around. I might hope to be around. I can't guarantee it. So welcome, everybody. Bonnie in the house. Happy to be here. And let's get started with introductions from my panel. First up, brand newcomer to this show, Professor Agnes Dive. Professor, welcome. Bienvenue. Comment ça va? We'd love to have you spend a couple minutes telling us who you are and why the heck are you on this panel today? Go ahead. I'm a transformation professor. I'm uh, combining transformation science and practice. What I do on a daily basis, I try to understand what really makes people change, like deeply inside of them. It's not about like feeding them with the carrots and like rushing them with the sticks, but really where is the hidden deep insights for the human change. And then I use technologies to amplify these insights and actually build different kind of technologies that would help people to achieve their goals. And most of the people would like to live in the state of well-being, flourishing. And then we recently speak about flourishing cities and the cities of the well-being. So all technology that we can also put in the hands of the users, but not only, also for the organizations, how we can improve the organizational hyperperformance. And the same goes up to the societies, to the neighborhoods, and to the cities. How we can overlay the built architecture with the technology design that would be unobtrusively helping societies to move towards the better states of their being. And I do practically have the employment at the business school where I do teaching, research, and also directing a grad program on managing artificial intelligence. And then I also established transforms.me, which I call that's a gateway to the transformation, which is a collection of the scientific articles, the science. It's also a collection of the TEDx talks, different kind of videos. And there is also a framework that anyone can take and apply. It's called Transforms Me Design Framework, which is a collection of the science, which is made easy to understand for everyone to apply to their organizational problems, to societal problems, to any kind of things that people would like to change in themselves. So essentially, my passion is I want to help people to get where they want to get. 
And that journey really implies understanding of our human nature to the depth that we can inform the technology design so that help that technologies can actually help us to get where we want to get. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you. A couple of quick questions. What university are what university are you where are you working at? Are you teaching at? Where is it? So that's in France. And the university comes from Normandy. So it's Ecole de Management de Normandie. So it's EM Normandy Business School. And it has the main campuses in the Normandy, two of the main cities, and then Paris. And then they also have the campus in Oxford, the UK, and also in Ireland in Dublin. Thank you. And when you tell people you teach and you study and you work on transhuman technologies, do they get scared and run for the door? Are they afraid to talk to you because they think it's something from out of another space and time? What do they think? Depends. Depends on their state of the consciousness. So if they are already on the journey to uncover themselves, to open them up for the new possibilities, then they kind of get curious. Oh, that sounds interesting. Tell me more. And then, of course, if the people are into their rat race and are not having time for themselves and actually be aware of what's happening, then they kind of, okay, thank you. Uh, who is next? <laughs> okay, thank you for the, uh, I appreciate the honest answer. Let's go around the table. One seat to Chris Kalabukas. Chris, welcome to Technology Revolution, the Future of Now. Delighted to meet you for the first time just a few minutes ago. And a shout out also to Marty Constant, who was on the show a few weeks ago with Jacob and Linda. And Marty was so thoughtful to invite Chris and Professor Agnes Dibe to join me today. So shout out Marty. Everybody wave. Hello, Marty. If you're out there watching, <laughs> listening, we Appreciate that. Chris, introduce yourself. What do you do and what is Hello Future? Hey, buddy. Uh, Thank you so much for having me on the show. This is fantastic. I love uh, talking about the future and being with all these eminent futurists. I think I've been a futurist for ever since I could read because I remember my first, my earliest memory is reading science fiction under the covers with a flashlight after my parents said, okay, you got to go to sleep. Uh, and just imagining these these amazing future worlds, and I wanted to grow up to become not a, not just uh, sort of write about those things, but actually create those types of futures. So, a little while ago, I figured out that I'm a kind of a weird combination of philosopher, engineer, and futurist because I have a philosophy degree, I have a uh, I've done engineering for a long time, technology, and I've always been interested in the future. So I sort of combined those those three things together and basically created Hello Future, which is a consulting company that helps companies to companies, uh, sort of corporates and startups, to uh, sort of imagine the future and then figure out how to get to that future. And like I said, I mean, what I love to do is help to ideate and create and envision those kind of futures. And it could be in a short term, uh, medium term or long term. And it just gets me excited thinking about the future because, you know, we all know the past is done. There's nothing more you can do with that. Um, You can help it. It can help you inform your future or where you're going, but really the future is so open to possibilities that there's so many amazing things that we can do. I think we spend way too much time not thinking about where we're going to go instead of where we came from. I wish you showed a little enthusiasm for the topic. I'm only teasing you. I love it. Our listeners out there, I'm doing all my radio shows on Zoom, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being able to see my panelists. And it's wonderful to see, see how they think and see how they mm-hmm. react and see what kind of body language they use. And I will tell you that Professor Agnes Dibe is wearing an amazing bow tie where you can poke his fingers through it so it's the same as his shirt underneath. And everybody looks wonderful. And it's just such an enhancement of the radio experience to see my guests. So that's so if, if we comment during the show, if I say, Chris, I love your headset, or that's a really cool <laughs> Hello Future sign behind you, it's because I can actually see Chris in his, in his habitat, if you will. So Chris, thank you. <laughs> and Chris, do you consider yourself a transhumanist? Uh, similar to Agnes? Do you consider yourself a transhumanist and does it scare people? Uh, yes, I do. And yes, it does. Okay, thank you. That's <laughs> what I wanted to know. It's kind of like one of those things where, um, you know, if you don't have the right political beliefs, you kind of have to hide them because you're worried about what's going to happen to your to your career, what's going to happen with your job, etc. So you, you, ha- you can have those beliefs, but you have to keep them within the transhumanist community that you hang out with. Because, I mean, I love Aubrey de Grey. I think his concepts are perfect. It's like, just just let's figure out how to live another 20 years. And within those 20 years, we'll figure out how to live another 20 years and so on and so on and so far. You know, I'm all about an optimistic future and transhumanism, you know, is about improving humanity. And I'm all about improving humanity. 
Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I was going to tell you at this point that, and, and uh, Jacob and Linda know that when I close the show, I say, if people tell you the future is already here, I say, no, that was yesterday's future. We're all here creating today's future. That's why the show exactly. is called The Future of Now. It hasn't happened yet. Get over it. You're all responsible <laughs> for it. Thank you, Chris. Welcome back. You took a, a, about a 20-second freeze moment there, and we're happy to have you back. That. No, it's not your, not your fault. Jacob Perkins, welcome back, Jacob. I miss hey, you. You're good on morning, Bonnie. Ago. Jacob, in case there's one person out there who doesn't remember you from this show, on the off chance, just one person around the world, why don't you reintroduce yourself to my audience? Yes, uh, my name is Jacob. I am a clinically trained social worker, but I have the um, blessing of being able to have a very eclectic career, one both in macro sociology, globalization. Um, I'm also boots in the ground in a hospital setting, working with patients. So all of these kind of changes that COVID has pushed over the last three months, I'm kind of seeing how that's going to impact service delivery with all these health populations in our larger healthcare human service systems. Um, that's where I've worked for over a decade. And so my mind kind of brings that all together. Where have we been? Where are we going? And how can we best serve vulnerable populations? At a larger level, I'm very much interested in how digital transformation is going to impact cities and ultimately health outcomes, particularly in developing countries. So that's something I tend to focus, focus on in terms of research. Thank you. And Jacob, I know a few weeks ago you emailed me that you had been almost nonstop in emergency rooms. Are you based in New York City, Jacob? Do I have that right? No, I am in St. Louis. I am a Missourian. Um, Maybe I'll relocate in the future. I'm looking at the (laughs) southeast right now, actually. Um, Come on down. (laughs) uh, We will. We are very much interested, but there's a lot to do in St. Louis. where I could talk about what we have specifically in terms of our healthcare ecosystem and our business accelerators and our startup scene here. So uh, people people outside the Midwest might not think that much, but we have a lot going on. And, And what was it like being, I'll use the word in quotes, air quotes, on the front lines as a a healthcare, mental healthcare worker in the past couple of weeks and months for you? Just briefly, Jacob. I would say a lot of, I mean, we can throw around the words that everyone's heard, stress and anxiety. You know, for me as a clinician, I know that, you know, your central nervous system is up more and then that's going to have sleep issues. And so I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of cert people in the front line, a lot of um, essential staff that are high stress right now. And, you know, we did the best we can to support each other. We put systems in place, programs, reemphasize mm-hmm. EAP and accessing that. But the impact of this stuff will really emerge in the next 12 to 18 months. Thank you very much. And probably impacted people's view of will there be a future and what will that future be? And that's a whole other show we might do. There is an existential dread that accompanies this experience. But the flip side of that is there might be more time to reflect on where we're going and what we could produce, at least if you can bring some hope into that situation and kind of hold on to it. Thank you, Jacob. Welcome back. Great to see you. And Linda Roth, here you are, Linda, dressed in a beautiful light teal, I guess a turquoise jacket. And Linda, we'd love to hear from you. Refresh everybody's memory. What do you do? And what's your relationship to this topic, transhuman technologies? Linda Roth, you're on. Well, thank you, Bonnie. It's great to be back with you. And um, I am also a consultant primarily with business. I've been in the technology industry since early in its days when it was just crunching numbers for accounting in businesses. But today, technology touches every part of our lives. And so I work today mostly with companies to get them ready for the future and understand how it's going to impact, impact them and what new opportunities they have and, and get them to what I call reimagine their business. I have just written a book that's currently being published um, on digital transformation and its impact. And in that book, I talk a lot, a, a lot about how some of these technologies we'll talk about today are going to impact businesses. Thank you very much, Linda. What's your thought about transhumanism? Is it scary to you? Uh, uh, you were one of the original panelists on a topic we did with Jacob and some other, including Marty Constant a couple of weeks ago when I said, let's talk specifically about transhumanist technologies. And I sent you the list. Did you say, wow, this is exciting? And you say, I don't know if I want to be associated with that. I'm, I'm serious, Linda. What was your thought? My thought was, wow, this is exciting because um, – I think that there are a lot of things like if you just look in the health industry and what we might call as transhumanist, um, it can help in in humans and helping humans be able to, like especially people with um, disabilities, 
We have tremendous opportunity there. And, and also today, uh, over the last, let's say, 50 years, we've been um, improving people's lifespan and health, but we do it all through drugs. And a lot of the drugs destroy other parts of the body. Right. And so with a lot of technologies, we'll be able to cure these diseases or treat them without having to use the drugs that we use today. I welcome that day. I am a non-chemical. I'm a I'm a chemical phobe, actually. Mm-hmm. I I've had teeth pulled with no Novocaine. The only thing they won't let me do is go under major surgery without sedation. And I always rewrite my will if I have to have major surgery because I think that the the shock to my system, the fear, the whatever you call it, the phobia, will actually kill me <laughs> rather than the <laughs> surgery. So far, I've done pretty well. My kids are always saying, "Yeah, ma, you're still here. It's okay. No, there's a new will. Make sure." you get it anyway blah 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 thank you so much i'm going to do i'm going to welcome our sponsor so we can give them some time now so panelists just bear with me here we are welcoming back last week they were a new sponsor we're thrilled to have them back it's molecule i'll spell that m-o-l-e-k-u-l-e air purification reinvented for every room and in any home and we sure need a lot of that today so molecule is reimagining the future of clean air starting with the air purifier it's not just an innovation on existing technology, but a scientific breakthrough in air purification. I'm going to tell you how. Their core technology, PECO, PICO, or photoelectrochemical oxidation, actually destroys harmful pollutants in the air like, I'm going to read the list here, viruses, uh-huh, bacteria, uh-huh, mold and chemicals, instead of just pulling them into a filter like a lot of other so-called purifiers do. Molecule air pur- purifiers are designed to help protect homes, businesses, and medical spaces so you know they're destroying pollutants and providing clean air. With so many of us spending more time at home, come on, all my panelists are shaking their head up and down. Yes, we all know that. Clean indoor air is more important than ever. I'm looking at Professor Stibes eyebrows going up and down with his bow tie. Molecules Pico technology meets the performance requirements in FDA guidance for use in helping reduce the risk of exposure to SARS-CoV-2, to the COVID-19 virus, which we're living with right now, and in healthcare settings. In independent testing, a molecule air purifier was shown to reduce concentrations of MS2, which is a SARS-CoV-2 proxy virus, by over 99.9% in one hour. How close to perfect can you get? Well, it's important to maintain other good preventative practices. This provides an extra layer of virus protection for your spaces. As far as design... It doesn't look like any other air purifier you've ever seen. Molecule air purifiers are beautifully designed. Think of, now everybody listen up, Molecule is the apple of air purifiers. And we all know how excited we are when we open, my panelists, we open a box of a new Apple product and we say, this is really sleek. This is really cool. Well, that's what they've done. Not only is the technology inside revolutionary, but the units look sleek and modern, made with premium materials, minimalist sensibilities molecule complements any room in your office or home while destroying viruses molds allergens and bacteria discreetly and effectively and i'll just tell you there are four different sizes molecule air for large rooms up to 600 square feet molecule air mini for small rooms up to 250 square feet Molecule Air Mini Plus helps protect small rooms with a particle sensor in auto protect mode, which adjusts the fan speed based on the sensor. That's high tech. And Molecule Air Pro RX is FDA cleared as a 510K class two medical device. Jacob may know about this intended for medical purposes to destroy bacteria and viruses in the air. And you're all wondering, Bonnie, this sounds great. How can I get it? Well, I'm about to tell you. Here's a special offer for my listeners. For 10% off your first air purifier order, visit, I'll spell it, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com. That's molecule.com. And at the checkout, enter the code for the show, TechRev. I'll spell that too, T-E-C-H-R-E-V. They're only shipping to the U.S. and Canada at this time, but it will be to other places soon. So again, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com. In a checkout, enter TechRev, T-E-C-H-R-E-V. And thank you to Molecule for sponsoring the show today. We're happy to have you. Now it's time to go to the quotes my panelists have sent me. So Professor Agnes Dyba sent me a quote from the Matrix film. And it was, as we talked about before the show, Agnes, it was the 20th anniversary last year and everybody 
was sending me Matrix quotes, and I knew who Spoon Boy was, and I knew who Neo was, and since I didn't know the movie, I, I forgot them all. So you've sent us, let me read a little bit, Matrix 1999 science fact fiction action film written and directed by the Wachowski star. What a panel. What a cast. Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, Carrie Ann Moss, Hugo Weaving, and Joe Pantoliano. And it's the first installment in the Matrix franchise. It depicts a dystopian future in which humanity is unknowingly trapped inside a simulated reality, the Matrix. I'm just going to leave it there. Sounds like what we're talking about today, doesn't it? Yes, it does, Agnes says. Here's the quote. Let me read a little bit. Maybe I'll read it all and you'll explain it. So here's the quote. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth. Nothing more. Agnes, how did I do with that? Was that okay? Almost. <laughs> <laughs> well, do it better for me then. Go ahead. <laughs> Come on as panelist. Go ahead. You have to You're see up. the movie. You have to see the movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I include this in my talk. So what I didn't say in the beginning, I do actively give keynotes. And sometimes before I get on the stage, I run this small, short clip before I actually there. So that is actually from the movie and this whole is spoken to the people. And it's all about our choices, the blue pill and the red pill. And it's a mind awakening moment that every single next step, every single next day, every single next future depends on our choices. And that's how trivial it is. And it has to be reminded over and over again. And I think the last sentence, which is remember, all I'm offering is the truth. And that speaks to my scientific mind it's it's not about getting money famous or anything it's about getting to the truth and that's why i'm working on the human nature because we know the truth it's right in here it's our evolution of our biological super machine telling us the history through our dna and if people say i, I cannot do it the genes are screaming we know how to do it you just need to get your head a little bit silent so that you listen to us not to what your mind is like, like now circulating and what you are telling yourself that you cannot do it. Very interesting. I, I'm recalling on a radio show a couple of days ago, I was, we were talking about choice, Agnes, and I mentioned that when you first learn, when I first learned binary math, you have a zero and a one. And a lot of people say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do X, Y, Z. I'm not going to buy that car. I'm not going to go to that school. I'm not going to eat that pasta, whatever it is. But they don't realize or don't acknowledge that by saying I'm not, they have made a choice. It is all about choice, Agnes. Really great point. Thank you for that. Let's move on to Chris. Chris has sent us a quote from Meet the Robinsons, 2007 film. I don't think I ever heard of that one. Two seventh <laughs> American computer animated science fiction comedy film produced by Walt Disney Animation Studios, released by Walt Disney Pictures on March 30th, 2007. It was the 47th Disney anima animated feature film released in standard and Disney digital 3D versions based loosely on the characters from the children's book, A Day with Wilbur Robinson by William Joyce and included in the cast of the voiceovers. Let me see. Laurie Metcalf. Everybody knows her. Adam West, Tom Selleck, Angela Bassett, Harlan Williams, and others. So let's go to the quote. Three words. Everybody listen up. Keep moving forward. I'm not even going to try to pretend I know who said that. Chris, <laughs> talk to me. Where does this come from? What does this have to do with well, our topic today? So, so Meet the Robinsons is actually about a family of inventors. So there's a dad, there's a dad inventor, there's a kid's inventor. So like they're all inventors and they're all, they all basically spend their time coming up with new inventions, creating new uh, products and services, like things that uh, improve life for humanity. Right. And it goes from being like a regular, regular world to a futuristic, amazing world where humans are taken over. Uh, I mean, taken care of. And it's just such an inspirational quote. And apparently it's a short, it's just shortened version of something Walt Disney said himself about, about the future and how we create the future. And that's what I love. That's what I love most about it. And I'm all about invention too. I mean, I spent a lot of time inventing and I mean, invention is how you create the future. So without invention, there is no future. Well, that's my all, also a famous quote. I think it's debatable whether it was Alan Kay or whether it was somebody else uh, or Peter Drucker. It was, if you want to want to predict the future, you have to invent it. Another version, you have to create it. Chris, just briefly, what do you invent? Any Anything we would have in our house right now that has your name on it? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, all my stuff is a little too far out for that. I mean, most of the time they fit in the patent patent space. So they're five, six, 10 years out. Things that you can't really do today, but are really cool, interesting ideas that could turn into something. I mean, I'll give you an example. One I did for one of my financial services customers is a uh, device that actually tells you how well your portfolio is doing based on smell. So you walk into your home and if you smell vanilla, you're like, oh, my stocks are up. If you smell vinegar, your stocks are down. So that's one of the most recent ones that we created. That's, that's a riot. I had an author on my uh, my personal radio show many years ago had a, a series. He was studying the sense of smell. I think he was in Florida. I can't remember the gentleman's name. And he wrote books on how your personality, I can't remember whether the personality came first and the sense of smell second or the sense of smell defined your personality. But if you liked, let's say, the smell of cinnamon versus, the, I can't say the smell of salt because it doesn't have one, but the smell of cinnamon versus the smell of vanilla, what does that mean? about your your tastes in life it was a whole series of books i interviewed him many times can't remember forgive me on that thank you chris fascinating jacob perkins let's move on to you you've sent me a quote from kevin kelly very serious quote author of what technology wants and it's a book according to the review on amazon suggests that technology as a whole is not just a jumble of wires and metal but technology is a living evolving organism with its own unconscious needs and tendency, and Kevin Kelly looks through the eyes of what he calls this global technological system to discover, quote, unquote, what it wants. So let me read the quote now. Humans are the reproductive organs of technology. That almost makes me scared. (laughs) Jacob, how did you find this quote? Go ahead. Well, everyone, most people in futurology and um, any sort of Lots of readings on technology and society are well aware of Kevin Kelly, right? He used to work for Wired. That book caused a lot of controversy when it first came out decades ago because um, of quotes just like these. I wanted to be able to shock you, and it appears I have, Bonnie. When we think reproductive <laughs> organs, we think evolution, biophysiological processes, but we're talking about technology. And kind of I think what uh, Professor Agnes was kind of hinting at, the evolution of society as a whole really does – revolve around right now where technology is going and what it will be um, in the future. And I want to kind of bring those constructs together because unfortunately in our mind, we keep them separate, right? And a little bit later, one of my talking points will be uh, mind-brain interface. And so hopefully we can revisit this, this topic further, the integration of technology and the human consciousness. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jacob. I just got a note from Aaron to increase my volume. Aaron, you got to text me and tell me if I did it. Fine. Thank you. I'll even lean in a little bit. Thank you, Jacob. Very, very interesting. And now let's go around the table to Linda, who is waiting so patiently. And she has sent us a quote from Doc Brown in Back to the Future, the 1985 first film of the series. It was an American science fiction film directed by Robert Zemeckis and written by Zemeckis and Bob Gale, starring Michael J. Fox as teenager Marty McFly, who accidentally travels back in time from 1985 all the way back 30 years to 1955, where he meets his future parents and becomes his mother's romantic interest. Let's not go to that Oedipal thing over there, or whatever it was. Linda has picked the following quote. Your future hasn't been written yet. No one's has. Your future is whatever you make it, so make it a good one. That's the closing line from my show, Linda. Talk to me. How did you find this? Well, I was, I was searching for quotes in futuristic movies, and this one spoke to me because um, so many businesses, business people that I talk to and just individuals, they think that their future is cast in stone and that there isn't anything they can do about it. And in reality, we can do everything with our future. And, and so that's why I liked it was uh, our future, whether it's our personal future or our global future in terms of technology and everything like that, it isn't written yet and we can create it or invent it as, as Chris would have said, we, you know, it's all up to us. Thank you very much. All good quotes. Thank you, lady and gentlemen, for your efforts to pick really interesting quotes. We loved all of them. Now let's go back to the top in my 25-page notes. No, it's only nine pages. Sorry. And let's start with prediction number one. Uh, Let's see if we can keep this going. Maybe two minutes apiece. See how many we can cover out of this top 10 list of transhumanist technology trends. So I'm going to pick one from Agnes, then one from Chris, then one from Jacob, one from Linda. And let's go around the table. 
You can comment to each other, but I want to keep the keep the new knowledge coming. So uh, let me just read a little bit Agnes said about AGI. This is funny, yet another example of how people demonstrate their inherent impediments. I'm just going to stop there. Agnes, AGI, quickly define it and tell me what's so funny about it. Funny is how we use our limited perceptions about the world and the reality and then kind of impose that to the artificial intelligence and the most funniest part is when people really express their ignorance through the communication by saying oh, it's gonna kill us or something like that like what we see in the movies and it's the human nature and it, the better we understand that the better we will be able actually to give a proper meaningful instructions to the AI. So AI is just like an extension of our intelligence. If we haven't figured out how our intelligence emerges from the neurochemical signals and nets <laughs> and transmitters in our brain, how can we speak about any intelligence if we haven't understood ours? And therefore, we also sometimes have the discussion, what will be the remaining qualities of the human being that would be difficult in the end to kind of pass over to the artificial intelligence. And I would say definitely creativity and imagination because artificial intelligence could be able to construct out of the five elements, a variations and combinations of those, but who will tell the artificial intelligence, which of those combinations actually make sense? <laughs> What's the meaning? What's the purpose and imagination. Uh, the recent video that I posted on my YouTube channel was about can the artificial intelligence imagine the imagination of the artificial intelligence to make it even more complicated for, for the other kinds of uh, intelligence to actually be with us. <laughs> Interesting. It's almost a tautology. How, yes, uh, intelligence talking about intelligence. A quick question for you, Agnes, if you will. Artificial general intelligence, AGI, we're used to just talking about AI. AI is going to do this, AI is going to do that, AI machine learning. Where did the general come from? Does that, is that a new flavor of AI for us? Just quickly. It's to make a little bit more informed the conversation for the people so that they would start to label the present applications most of the present applications of, of artificial intelligence are specifically designed for a particular task. And for some reason, it's kind of awkward. And then out of the realization, we have the artificial intelligence for the finance. We have the artificial intelligence for the pattern behavior, behavior detection. And then, okay, but then we cannot use the same term for the intelligence that could be similar to the human intelligence. And this is where they plug in the word general <laughs> because it kind of covers all the ap ap possible applications which is pretty much what we people do we kind of apply our intelligence to all of the life experiences and i would just be very critical that we should be better at labeling things and better at communicating things for the general audience and therefore thank you for having this show i think it's a great opportunity for people to get into the basics of the Novelties. You're very welcome. I'm, I'm pleased to do this. I'm fascinated by this. Chris Kalabukas, you are up next. Chris told me prediction number one, augmented and virtual reality will merge into a multi-purpose interface device that connects directly to the brain, bypassing all sense organs, allowing for true multi-sense virtual reality. Look, Chris, as they say on the news, will you please unpack this for me? I have no idea what I just said. Just translate it into English sure. for real people. Go ahead. Sure. One, one more thing uh, on the AGI question. Basically, AGI is kind of re replicating a human, right? Someone who can handle anything, like a device that can handle anything. Because like right now, AI is real specific for fields, but an AGI is replicating a really multifunctional human being who can do anything. So short on that, but the thing about augmented virtual reality, see right now what we're doing with virtual reality and augmented reality is we're wearing things, right? We're wearing goggles, we're wearing glasses, we have headphones. What we're doing is we're feeding things into our senses. And, and then those senses are converting them back into a reality in our brains. So it's, it's imperfect, we're, we're faking it basically. But if we could somehow interrupt 
the between our, our eye and our optic nerve and actually feed the signals in there and the same for our ears and the same for our other sense organs, then it would be much more real reality than what we're getting now. Like if you, if you just plaster this thing around your head after like 10, 15 minutes in one of those things, you know that you're not in virtual reality. I mean, you might, you might forget that you're in reality now and then, but you're not really truly experiencing it. Right. I mean, you must have done, if you've ever tried virtual reality, it's just, it's just not there. So I think we need to get to that point where we go beyond our senses and go straight into the, you know, whatever part of the brain you need to go into that drives those senses and feed that data right into that. Thank you very much. Sense? I'm I'm sure that made perfect sense. I'll have to replay, <laughs> replay the video when we're off the air. Thank, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. Of course. Hey, Jacob, I'm looking yes. at prediction number two, something new. Let's talk about microchipping, a foundation for cybernetics, acceptability based on intersectionality, post-industrial societies with high proportions of tech industry accounting for national GDP, gross, gross product, gross, yes, remind me. Gross GDP, domestic product. Gross domestic product. Thank you. With comparatively, and we wish it was all domestic, with comparatively high levels of communalism and declining affiliation with traditional, I'm going to stop there because it's just a bunch of words to me. What in the world is microchipping? Jacob, in, educate us. Right now, the current state for microchipping is to have an RFT or some other piece of technology that stores a lot of personal information, particularly consumer information. So it may have my bank account. I might have some other important things related to whatever I use to participate in my local economy and my society um, underneath my skin, right? Now, this hasn't been mainstream in the United States for several different reasons, um, we tend to have a lot of different societal views and score high on certain um, geopolitical measures in the United States. I mean, you can follow the General Social Survey out of the U Chicago and see, uh, you know, we're, we're going to score high on individualism, which moves against this. We're going to score high on privacy, which moves against this. We're going to score high on religiosity, which impacts this because microchipping is, is viewed, unfortunately, with a lot of value-laden terms. Um, so what I'm looking here is this is a foundation for cybernetics. At least I see the easiest way in for mass understanding and attitudinal shifts, right? Um, so the base level of microchipping here where I put that in and I can participate in an economy is something that's going to let the acceptability of cybernetics proceed. In countries right now, especially um, Nordic countries, again, where they tend to be more communal, they mm -hmm. tend to have some declining participation and some... Um, formal religious affiliation in churches. Those are the places that have had a lot of biohacking and a lot of microchipping. Um, so not to say we absolutely have to change those things within any given industrialized society for um, cyber next to move forward, but really focusing on the economic and, and kind of his attitudes towards using this tool to participate in, in con mass consumerism were probably helpful. The good news is a lot of younger generations don't have any barriers. So I think naturally moving forward, as younger generations become the primary consumers in their societies, you'll just see this integrate more. I'm okay with microchipping. I'll say that right now. I think it would be easier if I could walk around and have a lot of my personal identification information underneath my skin right here and accessible. I'd rather not pick, carry my, um, my fanny pack with my wallet, keys, and smartphone every time I go to an amusement park, right? <laughs> so I'd rather just microchip and be done with it because that's what I've been doing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we have no trouble microchipping our pets. And I've heard somewhere there was yeah. a news story that people are microchipping their kids. So well, it, I haven't it, heard of kids. I haven't heard about kids, at least not in the United States. <laughs> yeah, wow. it was somewhere in Florida, I think, that they, they that was it made the news because it was so notable, obviously, that you're chipping your kids. I mean, chip pets are chipped everywhere, right? I don't know yeah. I don't know pets I don't know any pets. Yeah, farm animals and farm animals in the United States are chipped. In fact we had a national it was mandatory to chip your animals as part of national policy. Well, the agro farming policy a few years ago is a big controversy, again, for the same reasons I kind of stated a second ago, to, to make the federal government mandatory for your livestock to chip it. Linda wanted to say something. Go ahead, uh, Linda. The yeah. Reason, yeah, the other reason to chip your farm animals, not only for ownership, but they, especially once we get 5G and a lot of, of the work in agriculture in terms of tracking everything, um, you can track the animal and everything that it's been given in terms of drugs or, yep. or um, 
herbs and things like that. You can track its heritage. You can track it all the way through the processing to, you know, the hamburger you get or, or the pork okay. you get. Blo- um, blockchain is the provenance of, of food, provenance of wine, provenance of any, any product. Yes. Linda, I want to get you on cryogenics. I'm looking at your predictions, and here's one we haven't talked about yet. Linda says, cryogenics for human preservation, aha, will be more for the preservation of a living person to be awakened in the future. The greater use of cryogenics will be more for less invasive surgery, freezing of other tissues such as donated organs, human and animal sperm and eggs, and for space exploration and alternative fuel sources. Linda, tell me about your POV on cryogenics. Interesting. Well, um, first of all, I know that, you know, cryogenics has been around since the 70s and people froze themselves, but it was after they died. So the question is, even once we learn how to uh, bring the, mater- the, the genetic material back to life, that was a person that had already had failing organs, something wrong with them because they passed away, right? And so what, what are they going to be like when, they, when they're brought back to life again? And we don't know enough about what, um, when we were talking about thought, the creative thought and, and what will be in memories and things like that when you bring a whole person that had passed away um, back to life. And I think what the greater good for that is, I don't know why somebody would want to, who is alive would want to freeze themselves to come back in the future unless they just wanted to be born in a different time. But um, you, you could do that upon request. But I think the best use of chirogenics is, is like today, we have so many people on waiting list for organ donation. And today you have to get organ donation from somebody else who has passed away generally. I mean, there are some things like kidneys and liver that can come from a living being. Um, but it has to be used in such a quick period of time, right? So if, if an organ like a heart becomes available, but nobody on the transplant list can use that particular heart, then it's wasted. Where if we can use cryogenics to freeze those, and then when somebody comes along that can use it, then we have a good organ. And, and of course, then that goes into some of my other predictions about how uh, we'll be able to generate organs and not have to use organs out of living beings, but that's that's the other top the other type of technology topic. Three D organ printing, it's happening already. Yeah, three D. Yep, that's right. I don't think we even have that on our list. Let's see if we can do another round. We got twelve minutes left before I have to close the show, and let's go to prediction number two from Professor Agnes Stibe. Agnes, mind uploading. You say this sounds very plausible, considering that our nervous system is a web of neurotransmitters. It is quite likely we can build bridges between human and artificial neural networks. Why don't you spend about 90 seconds talking to me about this and let's see if we can zip around the table and get a whole bunch more. Go ahead, Agnes, you're up. Yes, maybe to finish up with the general uh, artificial intelligence is that I would suspect that we would actually need it if we want to uncover a new realities that our perceptions and our minds and our brains are not predispositioned to, but actually we have them in our realities, especially if we speak about the physics of consciousness. That would be my aim to look at the AGI. But about the mind uploading, I think it's a technical thing to some degree, because if we have the set rules and, 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 and processes in our brains with the neurotransmitting, which is in and out, and there's a message circulating. So it kind of looks the same as we're using the internet. So it's the messages coming in and out of their routers. We just need to get smarter to understand how the brain does the magic using similar to terminology. So therefore, once we get there and we understand brains and the neurocircuitry and how it all works, of course, then, then we are good to replicate. I, I, I'm not saying that we are close enough yet, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think it technically we have a limited... Um, object to the, to discuss and to this to discover so the better we get into technology to understand our brains the closer we get to the mind uploading thank you very very interesting i'm thinking of all of the stimuli we get from media agnes from the tv shows we watch from the internet radio we listen to hello to our audience to the the news we watch whether it's on a tv or a mobile device or on the internet the movies everything we watch we are being bombarded and i'm wondering about the broad i'm just making this up but the general uploading of ideation of ideas and thoughts and creativity and imagination that comes to us every single day from external sources that we sometimes invite into our 
brains and sometimes we don't. You know, we walk by a, a billboard. I, I watched a, a show called, uh, there's a show on, I think Netflix called Upload. And it's about how you can buy your future when you die. And you can go to a place that is very, take a look at it. I watched two episodes and I got scared because I didn't want to think about that kind of thing. And I turned it off and I'm not going back. But if you have a chance, watch it. It's called Upload. And you buy, with the, the guy was in a, in a his pod, and Chris, I'm getting to you in a second. His pod was the, the uh, onboard intelligence system didn't see there was a big truck parked in front of him. And it crashed and he died as he's going down the hospital corridor in this go on the way to the emergency room. They say, you have a choice. Sign this paper. You can go to a very fancy place and somebody will have to pay for that or you can just die. And his girlfriend is saying, oh, I want to marry you in 20 years. I'll join you later. Sign the paper. And he signs the paper under pressure of he's about his body is about to expire. And then he goes to this place where there are agents sitting at desks with red chairs. Of course, I love that part red chairs and red computers managing his existence in this new cyber something other world that his girlfriend ended up paying for so she controlled his expenses and he was in the afterlife it's it's a anyway watch it it's i'm not promoting the show but it was it was crazy crazy so chris i'm looking at your prediction number four which is not on our list of trends but i want you to talk about it briefly your home will be a mobile and autonomous pod which you live and travel in chris how close are we to this Oh, uh, we're pretty close. And you know what? Societal pressures are going to have it. Actually, this is a bit cybernetic because it does connect to your brain. Uh, So I think what's happening now is that we're seeing all these societal pressures around super expensive homes in super expensive areas. So cities are getting really expensive. People can't afford to live in these cities. We're seeing autonomous vehicles. We're seeing uh, tiny homes. Like these three trends are all coming together to create autonomous tiny homes, right? So you would you would buy one of these things and you would live in one of these things. And I think this is like maybe five, 10 years down the, down the, down the road. But when we look at 2050, then I see them more as autonomous pods. So they're tiny, they're little pods that are, you know, human shaped and you basically spend all your time in them. And then if you need to travel, they just pick up your pod and take it elsewhere. You can travel on the road, you can travel in this, in, in the air or whatever, but you live in this pod. This pod provides all sort of like your life support, no matter what situation you're in. Cause if you think about it, human beings are pretty fragile creatures, right? I mean, we could get crushed by this or that, you know, uh, atmospheric temperatures, global climate change, all these things could uh, affect us. But if we're in this little life support pod and we spend most of our time in this life support pod, you know, we can go to, we can go live and do and be anywhere on the planet and even into space with uh, with one of these things. So I have this feeling that these autonomous vehicles that we're going to be creating for ourselves in the next few years are going to eventually shrink down into little pods that we spend most of our time in. Will we have an interpersonal life, Chris? Will you be able to kiss Oh, yeah, absolutely. The pods, and- the pods will actually connect to each other, right? So they'll be able to connect to each other <laughs> so you can have family pods. And it's all going to be modular. See, that's the thing about housing today. I mean, housing, if you think about it, it's like you have a fixed home, and then you have to, if you have a family, you have to go buy a bigger house. And, you, and if you are an empty nester, you have to go buy a smaller house. It's so inefficient. It's better to just have a bunch of pods, like one individual living pod for just you. And then when you have additional folks, you just sort of pod them all together. And then when they go off to college, those pods can go off to college and whatever. So, so it's, it's, we're going to base housing is going to become modular and personalized to, I mean, it may not be really tiny, but it'll be the size of a, a big enough for a human being to live in. And that's, that's going to be the future of housing. It's Movement like, is life in a 21st century world. Yeah. <laughs> and Chris, exactly. it sounds like that's a, Venn, it sounds and, like and, a and, human and, being Venn diagram where you have an intersection. Yeah. Okay, Bob, you're my husband. Yeah. Let's yeah. get our pods to intersect. Okay, go do something else. And Mary, you're exactly. my child. I'll help you with your homework. I don't even want to go there. Space colonization is next on my list. It's from Jacob. I think we're already there. Jacob, in, in terms of our conversation, Jacob says it's inevitable, captivating, now appears commercial, increased public-private partnerships with intent on colonization, galaxy mapping, further advancement in astrobiology to better inform our environmental practices. 60 seconds, Jacob, unpack this for me, please. Well, we all are aware of some of the historic events over the last two weeks. So I think the momentum's there right now. Societally start investing in such public-private partnerships. I don't think a national entity can do it in of themselves love nasa but i think we're going to need some of the technological capabilities that we have some some private entities to move forward with really enhancing um space travel with the end goal being space colonization 
a lot of environmental groups are already asking that we further astrobiological sciences once we nail down and build the infrastructure for uh, enhanced space travel right now with the hopes of, again, better informing what's going on in our world, right? We've been limited by... Um, our environmental science has been limited by what we can gather here. We need to gather more from outside so we can do the comparative research we need to inform our environmental policies. So I think there's a lot of promise here for solving uh, environmental problems, but also, of course, for moving beyond where we've been. Yeah. Thank you. Moving beyond where we've been, that's what we're trying to do. Linda, let's wrap up with you. Self-replicating robots, your prediction number three. You say concerns over the ability of our planet to support our increased population will be solved with various technologies such as gene therapy, molecular manufacturing. Self-replicating robots is the one I picked out of this, this list that will enable us to grow better and more plentiful crops using less land and time. Linda, pick any one of those three, gene therapy, molecular manufacturing, but I'd love for you to talk about self-replicating robots. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Go ahead, Linda. 90 well, the, seconds. The self-replicating robots is all about um, inanimate objects being able to be automatically replicated. And I, you have to have some of the other technologies to go along with that, but I don't think that's too far in the future. If we look at technology today, like in some of the big data centers and everything that you have, you already have technology that warns people, you know, sends out warning signs that says, I have a failure that's about ready to happen. So now all you have to add to that is instead of it just sending out, I have a failure that's about ready to happen, send me a new part, right? That it can make its own new part or can replicate its own new part. And and I think that's probably not that terribly far in the future, but I think where some of the bigger um, uses of that are is, is again in our medical research, right? If we mm-hmm. start creating um, some of our, some of the organs, or even as our own human organs fail, that we can replicate or fix them without having to go under major surgery to have it done. I, I think that's where the the real advantages are, and and I think that that's that's doable. I think there's a lot of optimism in what we've been talking about. I'd love to get a wrap up from each guest. If you promise me, you'll do it in 30 seconds or less. So, Professor Agnes Stibe, I'm giving you the honor of the first 30 seconds wrap up. Something about the future for our audience, transhuman. 30 seconds, Agnes, go and Chris, be ready. Go ahead, Agnes. Technology is nothing more than the biggest mirror that human mankind has ever had. Because technology, by definition, is neutral. But what we have seen technology is impacting us is all about reflecting what we have as a humans in our nature. All the good stuff, all the bad stuff. We can look at the attention economy. We can look at the, all other things. It's nothing about technology. It's all about us. And the better we understand us, the better we are in the alignment with ourselves, with our human nature, our desires to be living happily and fulfilled technologies are just the tools and they will be getting better the question is are we getting better there you go chris 30 seconds I, keep it tight i go agree ahead. with you 100 on the technology but i think it goes a little bit beyond that it's actually fear of change i think that's what human beings really have a problem with whether it's technology whether it's societal change whether it's you know no matter what it is if we could just get over our fear of change if we could just get over our fear of the unknown then who knows what amazing things we could develop for ourselves. I mean, there's so many factors and so many individuals who are basically holding us back as opposed to pushing us forward. I mean, there's, it's almost two camps. It's like the people who say, let's do it and see if it can be done. And the other camp says, should we do it? So they think about it. They look at all of the ramifications of it before they decide to move forward. And we need to be more in the let's do it camp. There you go. Hey, ho, let's go. Jacob Perkins, 20 seconds. Wrap for me. The level of knowledge in the world that we created will require brain-computer interface to expedite our knowledge management processes and allow us to evolve moving forward over the next 100 years. Thank you. Perfect. Linda, one sentence. Wrap up. Well, I'll go back to my, my quote. The future hasn't been written, and it's up to us to create it, and I think we have the ability to do that, and it's exciting. Bravo. Thank you. It has been exciting speaking with all of you. I'm just going to say a wrap up here for our call to action for our sponsor, Molecule. For 10% off your first air purifier order, visit Molecule, M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E dot com. And at the checkout, enter TechRev, the code for my show, T-E-C-H-R-E-V. Special appreciation to Professor Agnes Stibe. Such a delight. And come back anytime and bring your bow tie. Chris Kalabukas, Hello Future makes me think of Hello Kitty. And I like Hello Future better. My kids, my daughter did have a bunch of that stuff. 
Jacob Perkins, delightful to always see you. Thank you for taking time out. I know you've been busy. Linda Roth, always a pleasure and a privilege. And a big shout out and, and an air hug to Marty Constant for introducing us to Agnes and to Chris. You were both wonderful on the panel. Shout out to Ryan Treasure, my co-producer. He was that wonderful voice at the opening. And Aaron Keller, our engineer extraordinary, is probably telling me in the chat right now, okay, Bonnie, we're out of time. Wrap up. He said, yes, here we go. Veet, veet. That's French. Agnes does. Veet, veet for hurry, hurry. So here's my closing. Thank you for tuning into Technology Revolution, the future of now. Remember, the future of now did not happen yet. You, I, everyone listening, is all. we're all a part of making it happen. Let's make it a good one. Be safe. Be smart. Be well. Talk to you soon. Bonnie out. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for Technology Revolution, the future of now. Mark your calendar to join host Bonnie D. Graham every Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, 11 a.m. Eastern on the Voice America Business Channel to hear how technology is impacting your future now. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Business Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericabusiness.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio.